Hey guys, it's Goosebumps Completionist, and today I'm bringing you another Are You Afraid of the Dark episode review. This episode comes from Season 6. It was actually the first episode of the Revival era. It was written by Mark David Perry, and it was directed by Ian Patterson. And the episode in question is The Tale of the Forever Game. Now, I've actually seen this episode a couple of times now. I think this is like the third time I've ever watched it in its entirety. Uh, a while ago, years ago, I've always brought this story up. Somebody on YouTube had a bunch of these episodes uploaded. And Forever Game, I think, was missing on there. So this was actually one of the final Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes I ever casually watched when I was doing my casual watch through. And I can remember enjoying it a whole lot more <laughs> than I did going in it this time around, the third time. I started to notice a lot more flaws. And I guess as time goes on and as... You start to ingest more media, I've noticed. Your standards start to become more refined or you start to notice things that you just don't like in things a little bit more. And this episode kind of has that for me, unfortunately. Uh, for this being like the first Revival Era episode, does this kick off that stigma that the Revival Era seasons of Are You Afraid of the Dark are bad? I don't think so. But I also really enjoy this for... Some specific things off the bat. I'm a massive fan of Kyle Downs. And Kyle Downs, he starred in episodes in Goosebumps such as An Old Story. I think that was the only one he starred in there. And then he starred in my favorite Are You Afraid of the Dark episode ever, The Tale of Vampire Town. So having this episode that he's involved with in Kids Horror be like the third bonus episode, to, to call it that, is nice. Uh, aside from that, um, this episode is board game horror. <laughs> uh, and board game horror is some of the biggest hits and misses in the genre. You can have some really fun ones out there, and then you can have some really lame ones. And as you'll see in this review, this one is kind of in the middle. Uh, but I will say, if you have never seen The Tale of the Forever Game, or maybe you've never seen a revival era Are You Afraid of the Dark episode because you're a season 1 through 5 purist, or maybe you haven't tried Are You Afraid of the Dark before, or maybe you haven't experienced much board game horror, this might be a good stepping stone into the board game horror genre, or this might be a good light shed on uh, some of the fun aspects that the revival era seasons of Are You Afraid of the Dark had. And in my opinion... I think season six, while it has some of the worst episodes of the whole show, is still underrated and has some of the best ones in there. This one is not one of the best, but it's definitely recommendable. So, yeah, go check this out. With that being said, let's get into the plot overview without giving too much away. So, what makes this episode kind of different from your average Are You Afraid of the Dark episode is that this episode kind of brought back Are You Afraid of the Dark after a few years of hiatus. Uh, so the original run, I think, of the show lasted from 91 or 92 all the way through 1996. It lasted five seasons. And then it came back on a few years later in 1999 after Sinar, I think, sold the rights or gave the rights over to another company called Cookie Jar. And uh, they rebooted the show, essentially. So this episode kind of has to introduce you all to to the new Midnight Society with one familiar old school Midnight Society member uh, known as Tucker. And I don't think Tucker is even on the cover of this bootleg um, Blu-ray set I have, but Tucker kind of kicks off the new Midnight Society with the story. And uh, the story starts off with a group of three kids. Um, two of the boys are kind of older, and then you have the younger sister. I forget their names, but I don't think it's all that important. Uh, but the main character, he's kind of a snobby douche type of, type of guy. He's not nice to his little sister, and he loves to kind of pick on her in front of his friend. And his friend is actually played by the guy who played Billy Deep in the Deep Trouble 2-parter in Goosebumps. Go figure. Um, and I think the younger girl, I think she went on to star in, in a few things I recognize from Disney Channel, one thing being Eddie's Million Dollar Cook-Off. So go figure there. Uh, but the three of them are riding their bikes in the woods, and they stumble across this weird path out in the middle of it. And they peel back some shrubbery, and they see this, like, pretty much untouched by nature, uh, maze-like uh, area. So they decide to wander in after, you know, daring each other and calling each other's out on their wits. And they end up 
uh, inside of this maze of sorts, and they have their fun in there, and they're trying to figure out their way out, but they, they kind of realize that they keep making circles back to this specific tree that's kind of in the middle of this said maze, and uh, while the main character's uh, best friend and his little sister try to wander off to see if there's an exit point, he wants to look at this very old tree uh, that's in the center, and he touches it, and he gets put inside of the tree, essentially, <laughs> through some warping effects, let's just say. And he ends up inside of this room, and the walls are pretty much made of wood, like, like it would resemble inside of a tree truck, essentially. And he's greeted by this little boy, who's uh, named Nathaniel. That's the only character I can remember the name of. <laughs> and he's played by Kyle Downs. And uh, Nathaniel wants to sit down and play this board game that's in the middle of the room and he said it's, it he says it's called the forever game uh it's a game that has a lot of challenges and he kind of shows them like the centerpiece of the board which kind of has like a what 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 today would be considered like a a drone view of uh, directly above them i guess from the tr top of the tree's perspective looking outward and the main character sees his younger sister and his best friend and sees an opportunity after the Nathaniel character explains to him that everything that you manipulate on the board affects directly outside in this maze of sorts. So the guy starts playing the game to essentially pull pranks on him. And they sit down and they start playing the game. And how the game works is you have like this circular board and you have the spinner instead of dice. And whatever you spin, it lands on, I think, numbers one through nine. If you land on an eight, for example, you move eight places, but you have options and different pathways on the board that you can pick. So the main character starts playing around with this. And at first, one of the pieces lands on like a flower petal, which sends colorful flower petals flying around in the air outside. And uh, he sees how this affects his sister and his best friend. And then Nathaniel, you know, kind of, you know, explains that there are some bad pieces. And then the next uh, piece that gets landed on is some lightning, for example, which causes a lightning storm outside. But how the game operates is that every time you land on one of these pieces, it'll temporarily do whatever uh, until the next turn. And then it's overrid unless you hit one of two things that remain constant in the game. One of which is if you land on the night space. And the other is if you land on this beast space. And uh, the main character, uh, or I guess Nathaniel, lands on the beast. And the beast uh, <laughs> comes to life in the board game, essentially. It has a lot of beasts from the East from Goosebumps vibes. Uh, but when this beast comes out, uh, he's throwing daggers at, uh, at the sister and the best friend uh, <laughs> and chasing them through the woods, which I thought was really fun. Um, but after that turn is over, uh, there's a new thing that gets put into the game, let's just say, and, uh, it, it kind of, you know, hides the beast away because the beast is afraid of it. And, um, as the plot of the episode goes along, Nathaniel, as he's landing on pieces that the main character doesn't understand, or as the main character lands on a piece, Nathaniel's kind of dropping some hints that this board game's been around forever, he once was a player like the main character, but he uh, lost the game, essentially. So whoever wins the game gets the opportunity to leave the tree, but the other has to stay behind. And it's never really explained why, but that's just a thing in the story. So the main character realizes that he's essentially trapped in this thing, and he has to play to win. Uh, and he comes up onto a space where he can, has this opportunity to switch or move back 15 places, which will set him really far back in the game, which would make him lose. And Nathaniel explains that he can either switch with his best friend or his sister. And thinking on it, the, the, the guy has a moment of clarity and acts selflessly in the situation and decides to take uh, the negative 15 spaces to set him back. But Nathaniel keeps rolling no, um, or spinning low numbers to kind of bide the main character some time to figure out how to stop the board game. And essentially it comes down to an event after he's set back, he puts on lightning, and then Nathaniel lands on a piece that kind of sets um, sets whatever was previously played on until the other player spins again. So he relands on lightning, which causes a lightning storm. And uh, let's just say 
the sister and the best friend start messing around with the tree because from their perspective, they have no idea what's going on from the board game. They can only see this random phenomenon that's occurring to them inside of this maze. And they get this bright idea that the tree must be associated with it. And they start shaking it around. And eventually the beast <laughs> comes out. And there's also another, uh, I mentioned earlier, the night piece that if it, you land on it, it turns the rest of the game into nighttime. That also got landed on it. So it made it all take place at nighttime with not a lot of sunlight, not a lot of visibility, essentially. Uh, and uh, let's just say there's a climax that unfolds with the lightning and the tree. And uh, the main character has this idea that this maybe could stop the board game forever. And it may or may not work. And then we see the aftermath of the situation uh, with the main character, his sister, his best friend, and Nathaniel. And we get an update on about Nathaniel's current state of existence uh, and what that means. And then the story closes out with the Midnight Society. Uh, and in this specific episode, everybody is glad to be on board and to join this new club that Tucker's invited them to. So that's essentially the tale of the Forever Game in a nutshell. So yeah, um, this episode, let's start off with some positives here because I do have a few that I think really work here. Um, off the bat for this episode specifically, this episode is one of those fantastical type of stories that you'll find in Are You Afraid of the Dark? And one thing that I think Are You Afraid of the Dark did better than Goosebumps back in the 90s, uh, back in the golden age of kids horror, was the variety of the type of stories you got in this show. It wasn't just, you know, Monster of the Week or every once in a while you'll get a Twilight Zone type story or maybe something more serious and traditional horror like you would see in Goosebumps. Here you get, you know, emotional ghost stories. You get your Monster of the Week stuff. You get your uh, kind of wacky, heartfelt ideas. You get your, you know, milk toast Disney Channel original movie ideas. And then you get like fantastical stuff or science fiction every once in a while. And this is definitely a fantastical story. I, I kind of mentioned this in the plot over in the plot overview, but it, it's very reminiscent to something like The Beast from the East from Goosebumps, where the main characters stumble across this real life board game and they have to defeat the game in order to get out, right? So that's the stakes of the story. Uh, and one thing that I think also really helps it is the fact that the concept, I think, really works. So there's, there's something about board game horror that always has this similar constant, no matter what story you go into, and that the board game involves the player to actually have to play through the game and conquer their fears that the game brings out of them or whatever stipulations the game brings out of them in order for them to overcome the board game itself and to either defeat it or destroy it, as in this case. And I, I think that the concept really does work, and I think it fits well in this show. And I'm glad the show decided to tackle board game horror because it was really big in the 90s. You know, Jumanji was one of the biggest blockbusters for movies back in the day, especially for family films. And you've seen the effect that Jumanji's had on present-day films like Goosebumps 2015 and how that movie tried to basically rip it off. So, yeah, you know, board game horror... Th th this was the perfect time to do it, I think. And it was better late than never, I guess. So I like the concept to it. The acting was pretty serviceable, even for Are You Afraid of the Dark standards. Um, I would say uh, in this particular episode, the guy who played Billy Deep in the Deep Trouble episode, who plays the best friend of the main character in this episode, he wasn't too bad. The younger sister, uh, she wasn't bad either. Even the main character, who's kind of played up like a like a jerk, essentially, um, his actor was still pretty fun. He had some emotion to him. You, you know, he had, uh, that, that, you know, typical 90s thing, like the guy who played Max from Hocus Pocus. He kind of looks exactly like that guy who also played in Erie, Indiana, mind you. Um, but yeah, he was fine and serviceable, but Kyle Downs, I think was the show stealer in this. Uh, I really enjoyed his acting performance and Nathaniel as a character. There's some intrigue. While there are some negatives with the character I'll get into, uh, I do think that he was one of the best parts about it. And I have to say this, the beast in the board game, when he was shown, although there are some negatives with him too, he had some threat level to him. <laughs> He's going around throwing his <laughs> uh, fingernails or claws at the kids like daggers and it's sticking into tree trunks. I mean, that's some cool stuff. That's some legitimately 
good threats uh, to be had there. And um, I thought the effects on the beast looked incredible, uh, especially for this show. I couldn't tell if it was like a goblin or a Bigfoot. I think it was going for like a hairy goblin, um, which I thought was a big missed opportunity to tie into maybe the lore when I'll get into that in the negatives. But uh, yeah, the creature looked great. <laughs> um, and something about being in the woods naturally is unset unsettling. And Are You Afraid of the Dark is no stranger just having, you know, you know, kids wandering in the woods and coming across something. I mean, for, for crying out loud, Phantom Cab is probably the biggest example of that. But um, this one feels a little more focused than those other ones. And, uh, you know, I think it delivered a somewhat atmospheric package here. Um, so, yeah, some pretty sound positives with this episode. But there are some drawbacks, <laughs> as in negatives. And I will say this up front. The first negative I noticed about this episode is the budget. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think the camera quality here that Cookie Jar brought, you know, it's, you know, everybody will notice this when you're watching Are You Afraid of the Dark, specifically seasons one through five and then the revival seasons of six and seven, that the camera quality on six and seven feel a little more mainstream and less like that classic Are You Afraid of the Dark shooting. Uh, feel, which I think actually helps it for me. Um, there's also no character cutaways or monologue cutaways with the narrator of the story, like some classic episodes here, which I think is a good improvement. But the budget for this episode, I think, does not fit what kind of story I wanted to tell. This wanted to be like this fun, fantastical story, but they had shoestring budget, and they can only work with what they could. I can tell tell you now, they built this elaborate set piece in this really cool, ornate board game, and they spent some money on you know making some prosthetics for this beast. But other than that, this episode had next to no budget. <laughs> it was that's where all the money went. <laughs> And that's kind of unfortunate, and I think that uh, um, for this kind of idea, uh, yeah, it, it needed a little more emphasis on what the concept was trying to bring out of the story, and I just don't see it here. The second thing I, I think I noticed about this is the pace is so rushed in this episode. This is one of those stories that pretty much starts you in the thick of it. The kids are already in the f woods looking around, and then they almost immediately stumble across this maze. Some people might not have a problem with that, but as the story goes along, the pace, once, once the main character enters the tree, uh, it does start to show, because there's another negative associated with this, there's pretty much no plot to this story. Essentially, the, the whole concept is, the main character enters the tree, meets Nathaniel, they sit down to play the game, and then random stuff from the board game happens to the characters, and they have to find out how to stop the game. Um, there's no real... There's no real plot to be had. Now, you can make the argument that most board game stories kind of have this ailment, and that's kind of fair, but I will say in some other things, like the Haunted House game episode from Goosebumps, for example, uh, you do see... As the game goes along, you start to see the character. You see the characters collect things, and you see that while the, the the end goal, the end objective is the same as this, there's a lot more to the plot because there's side characters, and you know, I don't I don't know how to explain it. It just it feels like there's more there, and I think that's because that episode had a better pace and a way better budget compared to this. Uh, so when you have a poor pace with a plotless story, it does start to show because when you're throwing random stuff out there, quite literally, when the flower petal scene happened, almost two seconds later, the thunderstorm scene happened. And it was pretty jarring because of how much things they were trying to shove into this without showing the quality. And the, and the lightning effects look about as basic as you can get uh, in that generic way. Um, so yeah, lack of budget. Plot list, pacing all over the place. Those are the, pretty much the big three. But there are some other negatives, and I think these are more missed opportunities. And these are pretty much the two big ones here for me. Um, the first thing is, there's not enough monster in this story. And what I'm referring to is the beast in the board game. The board game idea is fine in itself. There's an immovable piece that you unlock. Kind of like, uh, if, you, if you've ever seen Jumanji, uh, when uh, the characters unlock the hunter. The hunter becomes another villain in the story aside from the board game. And he's pretty much the main villain that the characters have to run from. 
The Beast is kind of like that character, but we don't see enough of him. And when you do see him, you only see him for a brief second because the chase sequences are so choppy. And that's another negative in its own thing. Just the, the chase sequences and the editing in this episode is kind of choppy. But there's not enough Beast, and that kind of ties into the backstory of it all. Where I think there's a missed opportunity is, if this thing is like a goblin or something, this could be the originator of the board game. And maybe the tree itself is the goblin's dwelling. And this is how they bring themselves out into the real world. Uh, they, they like to play with humans and, and pretty much keep keep their soul to keep the game running or something. There, there There's so many missed opportunities with that that... It, it kind of irked me, right? And the, the last thing that I think I can tie to this along with the Beast is Nathaniel himself. I think Nathaniel is the most intriguing character in this story, aside from the main character who has that generic arc of getting close with his sister and kind of overcoming becoming a jerk, which is fine, and I I think that's wholesome, and I, I, I don't think that's a knock against it, but Nathaniel is strikingly underdeveloped. <laughs> in this episode he's kind of just thrown in there and as the story goes along he does have some knowledge that he drops to the main character and stuff but in terms of characterization i don't really feel like we know anything about nathaniel uh by the end of it and the ending we get with him is fine and all but i, I honestly feel like nathaniel you know for that to hit more emotionally i feel like we should understand more of his backstory or the tragedy of how he ended up inside the tree. I just feel like that's kind of missing in the story. Uh, which leads to my final negative. I actually have this other one. Is that the, the climax of the story feels very contrived and <laughs> um, let's just say convenient. Uh, when we're talking about the lightning storm and, and the tree and let's just say there's some statistical anomalies you kind of have to overlook in the logic department to kind of buy into that. It just seems so far flung and far fetched. And the way it's executed, it, it's all like like a one in a trillion odds kind of thing. And the disbelief you have to put at the door with that is just ridiculous. Um, it's kind of corny and cliche how many stories kind of play this huge climactic climax like that up. Uh, but there's, there, there's a lot of things there I just really can't overlook um, that get under my skin. Uh, so with that being said, The Tale of the Forever Game. I struggle with this one because... On one hand, I wanted to beat this episode over the head a little bit. But on the other hand, the strengths it does have, you know, compared to the rest of Are You Afraid of the Dark? Trust me, I've seen every other episode. Uh, I know its weaknesses as a, as, as a whole for a show. This one was kind of a breath of fresh air. Uh, but in terms of, like, board game horror, it's not that good. <laughs> so I was kind of leaning anywhere between a high D and a low C, maybe a mid C. And where I decided with this, I feel like I'm being perfectly fair. Um, I looked at it like this. All those negatives I mentioned, I think there was like six in total, maybe seven. Those were kind of like smallish to medium ones that kind of added up. So it's getting below a four guaranteed. Um, but I was leaning that 3.3, 3.7 range. And where I decided it might shock you all, but... The, the positives of what I have um, about this episode is the fact that this is part of the Kyle Downs trilogy of sorts. If we're counting Goosebumps as an old story and the other season six Are You Afraid of the Dark episode that he was in, uh, The Tale of Vampire Town. Since he's one of my favorite kids horror actors, I, I do find myself wanting to watch this one sometimes. And uh, it does fare well on my thoughts about it. <laughs> um, so... With that being said, I'm willing to give this episode maybe like a... I'm going to be as fair as possible, but not stretching it too much. I'm probably going to give this like a 3.6 out of 5 stars. This is like a C- minus fine episode, essentially. I mean, it's average. It's nothing special. It's it's almost pushing that light good. But I, I, I struggle calling this episode genuinely good because... There's just so many problems with it that other good Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes or kids horror episodes just don't have. And I feel like if this one probably maybe had a bigger budget or maybe had a cleaner idea in terms of plot and using the Beast more and explaining Nathaniel more, this would have been a way high-hitting one. Um, but given all that, 
uh, it does kind of sink it here. But it's a C tier. I this this is an episode that I recommend. I actually like it. Um, so if it got that, that's good. Um, so yeah, th that's my thoughts on the tale of the forever game. Let me know down in the comment section if you've seen this episode before. Do you love this? Do you hate this? I'm dying to know. And I'll see you next time.